Irwin's also an Associate Dean and Professor of Clinical Public Health and Pediatrics and Director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. The nationally acclaimed New York Children's Health Project, one of the country's largest health care programs for homeless children and their families, was developed in 1987 by Dr. Redliner and Paul Simon. It's the model for a number of innovative health care projects in the Children's Health Fund network of programs that serve disadvantaged child populations in 21 urban and rural communities across the country, including New Jersey. In 1993, Erwin Redliner, Dr. Redliner, served as member of the White House Task Force on Health Reform. It's okay to mention that, right, Erwin? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, under President Clinton, and he's an advisor to the health care policy of one of the current candidates for President of the United States, but I'm not allowed to mention him. <laughs> <laughs> it's not McKay. It's not McKay, okay. <laughs> it's one of the minor, <laughs> minor parties, okay. It, on a personal level, I've known Irwin since we were both at uh, Cornell, 1986, 85. We were both at New York Hospital, 87, both at New York Hospital. Uh, Irwin in charge of general pediatrics and me in charge of intensive care. Uh, and we both struggled under the uh, leadership of the uh, department in the hospital in the same way, became uh, good friends, uh, advocates for uh, children and disadvantaged children. Erwin has gone on to have a really phenomenal, distinguished career, and I've always been proud to say, oh, I know him. So we're very glad uh, to have him here. I'm honored to welcome you to speak on the medical home problems and disadvantaged children. Erwin? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, it was 80, 87, 21 short years ago. Uh -huh. Well, I'm very glad to be here, and I should say a lot of people came up to me and said hello, and that's uh, one of the uh, two big advantages of getting older, is that there are a lot of people around that knew you from one, uh, whenever. I don't actually know what the other advantage is, but I'm assuming there might be one. Okay. I am going to uh, discuss with you this notion of the medical home care, and I know that, uh, unfortunately, I didn't hear the whole thing, but I, I know that uh, Jim Perrin did talk a little bit about the medical home, and I don't know others may have, but I'm going to give you a perspective that uh, puts the medical home idea in the context of health care for medically underserved uh, children, which has been the focus of uh, our work at the Children's Health Fund and in my various academic posts over the last uh, several decades. And um, <clears throat> Before we get into the meat of this, I, I just want to say a word about medically underserved because that's really uh, the focus, as I say, of the, the work that I have been involved in. Oops, Vista. You know, I, okay. So medically underserved to me, very simply, is this, is a population has reduced access to medical care. And saying that immediately brings to the front two definitional issues. One is, what do we mean by access? And the other, of course, what is it exactly that we're talking about with respect to health care? Now, this may seem straightforward and simple to you, but I'll tell you that my experience over the last many years, um, and particularly in Washington, is that people who may otherwise be very, very sophisticated or involved in health care policy or legislation may have a very different version of what both health care and access mean than you and I might, as uh, for those of you in the U category who are pediatricians, uh, might have a very different category about it. And at the nexus between public policy and clinical practice are some definitional mandates that have to be discussed. So you ask a politician, what's access? And for many politicians, access is basically equal to uh, having health insurance. So if you have somehow a Medicaid, S-CHIP, private insurance card, that's about it. And they're ready to move on to the next uh, topic. And uh, this is something that, of course, we, we would want to nuance uh, very, very differently. The second thing is that they view health care as almost any kind of health care, including sort of dropping into the emergency room. Clearly, that's medical care. But in the way pediatricians look at this notion, certainly that kind of encounter is not what we mean by, by health care. You know, famously, in I think it was June of 07, uh, 
the outgoing president of our nation, uh, George Bush, said that he didn't understand what the problem with access was because you could just sort of drop in to an emergency room and uh, get whatever, whatever care you might need. And co coincidentally, that very same day, USA Today, the newspaper, had a front page story on access to, uh, on emergency room issues, and there was a picture, blazing color, of a totally overcrowded emergency room in some city in Texas on the same day that he announced uh, uh, that uh, anybody can get health care, they just have to go to the ER. If you ask, on the other hand, a pediatrician what we mean by access, hopefully most of us are talking about getting the provider and the patient in the same place at the same time and critically at the right time. So this question of timing and the context of care and the timing of care is an essential notion here. So it's the right place and the right time uh, that these, this, this nexus happens between the provider, healthcare provider, and the patient. What we mean by healthcare is unfortunately, or not unfortunate, but, but really is a very complex understanding of what the expectation should be for children in the healthcare system. So we talk about a comprehensive, family centered, and I added in here system based, and I'm going to tell you why in a second, uh, affordable health service that includes the entire range from screening and prevention to the diagnosis and treatment of acute and chronic diseases. Uh, the uh, management and coordination of uh, relevant specialists and special services, uh, all potentially and hopefully driven by a commitment to evidence-based practices and monitored by relevant outcome metrics. What the AAP has been calling for what, however many years, 20, Jim? Medical home? 20 years or so, uh, been referred to as the medical home. <clears throat> so this is a much more elaborate understanding of this challenge than the typical politician understands, which I'm mentioning this because when it comes down to the point of what we're advocating for, we really have to make clear what it is that we're saying needs to, needs to happen. A word about the uh, reason that I put system-based in there is that you can have the most incredibly comprehensive, well-staffed, highly functional ambulatory setting, but for medically underserved kids in particular, but children in general, if that, is not, if that is not part of a larger system of care, including secondary, tertiary, and sometimes quaternary care, if the flow of patients and issues cannot occur freely and appropriately, then we're still missing something in the paradigm. So I, I'm looking at uh, primary care, of course, in most of this, but it really needs to be attached to in the context of a healthcare system. Now, re recently, and mostly interestingly, in the adult literature, we're seeing uh, notions going beyond the basic um, uh, concept of a medical home. Um, and uh, in fact, in the annals of internal medicine relatively recently, the last couple of months, there's an article on the advanced medical home, which is, I think, the terminology that the adult provider community will settle on, the advanced medical home. We had a ridiculous amount of discussion up at the Children's Health Fund about whether it should be advanced or enhanced. I, I can't explain why we, it took us so long to settle on this, but there were proponents on both sides. But we ended up concluding that we like the term enhanced medical home that uh, refers to the specific set of additional needs that we see in medically underserved populations where there are, there are substantial issues of poverty, disparities, and particularly uh, difficult barriers to uh, accessing health care. So I'm going to refer a little bit to this notion of the enhanced medical home because that's really what I think is needed uh, with the patients that we'll be talking about and that are in our practices. So if you can envision the medical home encompassing those services that I mentioned before, which are, are basically biomedical services, and we surround that with other things, and just as these are just three uh, areas of additional concern that we have encompassed in our notion of the enhanced medical home, which include uh, mental health, behavioral health, is health issues, case management, oral health, and there may be many others, and there may be others that are very specific to a particular uh, population. But the notion is we want to we expand and widen our concept of what we mean by uh, the medical home. Uh, case management in particular, well, all of these, in fact, have ramifications uh, and implications for program design, funding, staffing, policy, and so forth. So these are all important and all things around which we're going to need to be strongly advocating in the uh, years to come here. 
So access to health care for medically underserved children means the availability of an enhanced medical home in the way I was uh, describing it in the, in the couple slides ago. And therefore, access is what medically underserved children uh, do not have. Now, this is the really the, the, uh, the focus of what our work has been over this now uh, 21 years. And I, for those of you who are not pediatricians, I just want to go through a, a short litany of the things that happen if all of your care is episodic or random or emergency room based and you're not in a medical home. Because a lot of very important things happen. It's not just that we have a pediatrician that we know, let's say, or a nurse practitioner who's following us over time. There are things that happen in that uh, relationship that are critical. So if you don't have a medical home, you lose an opportunity for a lot of health screenings that happen during the routine scheduled encounters with the doctor. So if all your care as an adult is in emergency rooms when you get sick, you will miss the opportunity to be screened for health conditions you might not be aware of that we want to know about early that, uh, that, that would benefit from early intervention. You lose the opportunity in the absence of a medical home for timely preventive health interventions, including immunizations. That's one of the reasons, that is the reason, why so many medically underserved children are behind in their immunizations, since they're not in a regular source of care, and a regular source of care is where you're getting those immunizations and other things, you just uh, tend to have a greater likelihood that you will not be immunized. Poor follow-up of acute illness. So if you see a, a two-year-old with a bad ear infection in the emergency room, that person may get uh, the right prescription but may well not get the right follow-up. So persistent chronic ear infections with attendant uh, hearing loss and potentially other problems may be a consequence, again, of not having follow-up in an appropriate environment. Uh, compromised management of chronic illness is probably obvious also. Yeah, the ERs can be uh, spectacular at doing the acute interventions, life-saving and so forth, but adults have to have their hypertension managed. Their, uh, their diabetes managed, children have to have their asthma managed, and actually it's a very, very difficult and challenging medical task to keep a child symptom-free from asthma, let's say. And that's not something that can occur in an episodic healthcare environment or certainly in an emergency room. Reduced access to critically needed specialists for the management of children with chronic illnesses, missed opportunities for health education, um, and in essence, what all this represents is if you don't have a medical home, you are relegated to focusing on a very, very narrow understanding of what healthcare is. So you're looking at a, at a concept that we're calling biomedical tunnel vision. So you go into the ER, here's the diagnosis, here's the lab test, the x-ray, here's your treatment, see you later. Whether you're living in poverty and tremendous stress in a violent neighborhood or other things going on around you is not part of the dialogue, generally speaking, in our emergency rooms. Um, so we, the Children's Health Fund got started actually because we had become, um, as Dan had mentioned, acutely aware of the problem of very rapidly rising homelessness among families in New York City, which was actually reflective of a problem happening in many large cities during the early and mid-1980s. So <clears throat> about 1986, uh, the problem had become so grave that it was then being reflected in, in, uh, in the media, front page stories in the New York Times and so forth. And uh, Paul Simon and I went on a tour one day of the Martinique Hotel, which was a, uh, a horribly squalid uh, facility that used to be a luxury hotel, I guess, on the corner of Broadway and 32nd Street. And it, when we got there, though, it was a, it was a squalid horrible uh, place with a thousand children and their families warehoused in there. The place was falling down. There was just, it was absolute chaos. And we got into the, the issue at that, at that particular point. What we found was throughout the city, these homeless children and their families were being in a sense warehoused uh, in environments that were just really unbelievable, including congregate shelters like this armory, uh, where there'd be hundreds of children and families there for up to a year and a half, two years, uh, they, you would have, is there a pointer of some sort here? No. Let's say this single bed, the single cot up here might be a 55-year-old uh, recently uh, psychiatrically discharged patient with an alcohol problem and uh, three feet away would be, you know, a mom and uh, two uh, young children. And this is where they'd be for this extended period of time. It's actually horrible. There were welfare hotels. There was uh, a system of care 
and an environment for homeless families that was extremely destructive. Uh, there are many ways in which uh, the homeless shelter system was affecting the health status uh, of children, both physical health and mental health, and uh, affecting access to health care. So, so when families would become homeless in New York City in the 80s, they would explicitly be placed in shelters far from their original neighborhood. Mayor Koch, it seems, felt it was a bad idea to have people placed too close to the original neighborhoods because the shelter might be actually in better shape than their original apartment was, and he didn't want people to be motivated to try to remain in the shelters. He wanted them to try to get out of the shelters or be motivated to. So if you're in the Bronx, he puts you in a shelter in, in uh, very far away in Brooklyn or Queens to make it as uncomfortable as possible. Uh, that's, I report, you decide. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, the pediatricians were, were not happy about this. But anyway, so disconnection from their previous provider. So a child may have been living in poverty, but going to a terrific clinic at you know, Montefiore Medical Center, uh, but now is in a different borough, really not having access anymore, losing all, uh, all possible uh, continuity that they had in their former uh, setting. Severe stress, endangerments in these shelters were rampant. I'm talking about physical dangers. I mean, a lot of the, the welfare hotels were privately owned, including that Martinique Hotel, so there were active uh, uh, drug dealing, prostitution businesses going on. It was violent at night, many of the rooms without uh, private bathrooms, so the children would have to be escorted to a common bathroom in the hallway by, by parents. It, it, it was just amazingly uh, difficult. A lot of overcrowding. Uh, you prescribe the amoxicillin, but there'd be no refrigerator. It would go bad, on and on. The, uh, the cascading problems that were associated with this condition of severe poverty uh, devolving into homelessness and lack of access uh, to providers. And um, I don't need to dwell on that, but you can imagine uh, what this was like. So for a pediatrician who, in fact, was living in a biomedical tunnel that, you know, you write the prescription, you get to see the next patient. For physicians with a broader understanding of the context and everything, it was, it was a nightmare trying to understand what the issues were and what it was that we could do something about. So homeless children in New York uh, are still a major target of the health services of the Children's Health Fund there. Um, and although there were about 12 or 13,000 kids at any given, on any given day in the shelter system in 1987 when our programs began, we're now up to about 17,000 children in New York City's shelter systems. They're not the congregate shelters anymore, and they're mostly upgraded, but not entirely. Uh, it's still a lousy situation. These are just the tip of the iceberg, though, because there were many, many, there are many, many other children who are essentially homeless but are not visible to the system because they are living in doubled and tripled and quadrupled up apartments, very, very uh, low income uh, ghetto apartments throughout the city where, uh, you know, there may be immigrant families or other very indigent families, and they they don't report themselves as being homeless. They just find somebody they can stay with, maybe a relative, a friend, or somebody they're paying a minimal amount. But these are a quarter of a million children who are just there uh, and uh, really not visible to the system. There's between five and 10,000 children, uh, I mean, talking about uh, youth and uh, adolescents who are living on the streets of New York. And depending on the season, the range is uh, at least several thousand. But can get up to, estimates say, about 10,000 street youth. Uh, and then there are several thousand children in New York City's foster system, which end up never getting placed or adopted or uh, kinship placement. And those children end up aging out of the system at 18, and then they're just uh, discharged to the streets. So the big picture of homelessness in New York City is an overwhelmingly uh, difficult and uh, large problem to, to uh, cope with. So the health care options for underserved children like these are probably what you know. So some children end up in the teaching hospital clinics. Some are going to New York City Department of Health or health and, uh, the Health and Hospitals Corporation uh, clinics throughout the city. This is all part of this multi-billion dollar public health system that New York City has, but it is what it is. Uh, very few uh, children end up in the private sector, uh, as you can imagine, and many, many end up uh, in emergency rooms. But mostly what these children get is some sort of random episodic health care uh, with poor follow-up and, as far as we could tell, very, very uh, poor outcome. The Children's Health Fund, which Dan mentioned I'm talking, uh, that I'm talking about, 
uh, basically started with a mobile medical unit that looks like this. These, we, uh, they're, they're, if you open, if you look inside of one, there, if you haven't seen them, two examining rooms, an immunization room, a nurse's station. Uh, the driver's seat turns around 180 degrees, and this little cluster here becomes the, um, the waiting room and registration room. And it basically, the concept is uh, what I used to do in Arkansas when I was running a Vista clinic in the early 70s, this arcane medical procedure called a house call. You know what that is? <laughs> it's an incredible thing. The doctor actually goes to where the patient is. They're looking at disbelief, Jim, but this is a, you, it's, it's a very, very uh, incredible concept. But what we did here was basically create a modern, mechanized, highly developed house call where just, we just didn't have only the black bag of, of medical things, but we took the whole clinic with us. That, and that's really what it was and what it is in our national programs. We also have a very, uh, I think, a terrific uh, health center for children and families in the South Bronx. We just opened a school-based health clinic and a new charter school in Harlem and other programs which um, allow us to get as much access as, as we can to those medically underserved uh, kids. We've done, num uh, done a number of studies of the health care problems that in our population. I'm just going to rapidly go through a couple of these. Um, and in this particular one, uh, for a patient cohort in 2004, um, kids three months to 19 years of age, um, but uh, just to give you a flavor of what we're dealing with, very uh, high rates of uh, loss of uh, common problems. So anemia prevalence for the kids in that particular study under the age of 36 was 19 uh, percent. National figures uh, keep that around 7 percent. The CDC's highest rate for minority underserved children is 15 percent. So lots of, uh, of anemia. Uh, recurrent or persistent otitis media we see an also very large prevalence rates and uh, really is a, is a problem in a variety of ways, which we can talk about later if you like. Uh, obesity and nutritional problems. Again, uh, numbers that we see in the homeless child population that uh, exceed uh, virtually all uh, national uh, standards. Behavioral health and mental health issues. Again, uh, very high rates, uh, very, very uh, problematic because as hard as it is for almost any child, to get good quality mental health, behavioral health services, you can multiply that many, many times for underserved children. So getting mental health or oral health services for kids who have global needs and are living in poverty is one of the great challenges of our day. Asthma, um, we uh, published in the Archives of Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine in 04, and we've been actually had a couple of uh, smaller studies since then showed that severe uh, asthma prevalence of 31.5% uh, uh, in, the, in the sheltered homeless population of children in New York City. If you add on to that, by the way, moderate and severe, you're into the 40% range. And if you had mild, moderate, and severe uh, diagnosis, then you're up to around 50% of the children those uh, several years in the, in the uh, middle of this decade uh, was uh, a, a problem that unprecedented, as far as we know, in, in uh, medical literature. The Children's Health Fund, since its programs in New York began, have also um, a, uh, developed um, models and replicas and now what is a network of uh, 22 sites around the United States. And in all of these sites, there are medically underserved child populations that we focus on with the same model which is comprehensive medical home type care uh, in environments where access to care is particularly challenging. And in some cases, uh, we're seeing homeless children in South Central Los Angeles and in the Anacostia community of Washington, D.C., but we're seeing very, very rural, isolated populations, uh, patients in Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, so forth. Uh, the Phoenix program is all about uh, street youth, for instance. So the common denominator is lack of access to care in uh, impoverished uh, child populations. There are several projects, including these three here in the Gulf, Mississippi Gulf Coast and Biloxi, and New Orleans affiliated with Tulane and uh, Baton Rouge with LSU, where we've responded to disasters, in this case Katrina, where we took mobile units, because they're mobile, and we took them down within a few days of Katrina to provide what we thought was going to be a few weeks or a couple of months of care. We ended up establishing permanent programs uh, in the Gulf uh, serving populations that were horrendously underserved before Katrina and now are in some other, completely some other level of uh, lack of access that, it, that's, that I've personally not uh, ever seen before. 
So we're there permanently uh, supporting these three uh, programs in the Gulf. Our program in South Florida actually, uh, which we started in 1992, was in the aftermath of Hurricane Andrew, and it was the same model. We went down, we thought we'd be there temporarily, and it ended up that we're there for a long time. So the mobile units turn out to be an effective way to do uh, uh, rapid response with good quality, uh, comprehensive care in disaster aftermath. Um, some of the other features of the Children's Health Fund is the, uh, let me just mention electronic health records and HIT technologies in general. Um, 1990, uh, three years after our project started in New York, we we're already having trouble physically moving these boxes of paper records from one mobile unit to another and families would be moved in the system. It, it was impossible. So over the summer of 1990, I hired a guy who hired a few people and we blitzed that and uh, by the end of the summer, we had put all of our paper records on, uh, on the computer basically. And uh, since then, I think we've been more or less in the forefront of the development of electronic health records for community-based uh, pediatric programs. And it's been very, very interesting and very helpful. Helps us follow individual patients, track the uh, general issues in patients, produce reports, and so forth. But really, it's now, it's, it's quite critical. Originally, we had a, uh, our own system that we developed with a consultant. Now we're using a commercial system called eClinical Works um, that we're just now converting our uh, network programs to. Uh, the final thing I want to say about our programs is that as we have seen uh, special needs, as our, clinic, as our clinicians are observing what we're seeing in large numbers, we've developed special initiatives for a number of them. The first one I want to mention to you is something we call the Referral Management Initiative, which we started 11 years ago. Um, and what happened was when I was doing a lot of the uh, direct health services at the Children's Health Fund, which is no longer really the case, uh, one of the things that really was most concerning to me was the fact that when we saw children who needed to see specialists, cardiologists, nephrologists, etc., we I, I would talk to them, I'd give them the appointment, we, we'd help make the arrangement, but only 7% uh, on average of those children actually got those speci that specialty care. It was just overwhelmingly difficult to make those logistic arrangements and have expect homeless moms to negotiate these systems in these complex uh, tertiary institutions. So we developed a program called uh, RMI, or Referral Management Initiative, which does a lot. Uh, we have a full-time staff that deals with the referrals. We have a, uh, one of the staff members who's, who now is physically based at Montefiore Medical Center, where almost all of our tertiary care is done. And uh, she escorts the families to the specialist, makes sure the specialist gets the info back to the primary care referring doctor and so forth but it's costly, but very effective. So in 1997, we're dealing with 7% adherence or compliance, and now on average for all, across all specialties, we're seeing between 60 and 70% compliance. Not perfect by any means, we have a lot of work to do, but we're seeing a, almost uh, virtually a tenfold increase in the successful completion of uh, tertiary visits, which is very important to us. The asthma that I mentioned to you, uh, we have a childhood asthma initiative um, and this has been unbelievably uh, helpful to our clinical teams. And that consists of very, very specific, explicit management protocols, uh, family education, psychosocial evaluations, environmental interventions, and so forth. And that has uh, shown itself to be, as I said, quite, quite uh, successful and far from perfect again, but uh, dramatic decreases in the uh, uh, in the degree of uh, asthma severity. So initially, 30% of the kids as I showed you before, roughly, or in the severe category, uh, after a few years, we're down to 15%, and as of last year, we're down in around the range of 9% or so of kids with severe asthma. So it is having a consequence. But I want to point this out to you, that in a practical sense, what makes this an effective uh, point for our advocacy programs is that <clears throat> we have reduced things like emergency room visits for children with asthma. Now, I. I don't know uh, what they're teaching you uh, these days in residencies, but a very long time ago, decades ago, when I was a pediatric resident at uh, Baby's Hospital, I was told very clearly that any admission to the hospital uh, of a child with asthma was a failure in outpatient. You're still being taught that? A failure in outpatient. Isn't that interesting? It's still the same. Okay. Uh, probably even more so now. And what do we have then? Theophylline and Epi? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. How quaint. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, we had uh, dramatic drops in uh, the uh, emergency room visits for our patients with asthma, and even more interesting was the drop in hospitalization. So we're dealing with almost 30% uh, of our children uh, over the course of the year being actually admitted to the hospital, and with the Childhood Asthma Initiative, that's down to 2% of the children. Now, that's interesting and medically important, but it also has economic consequences. So we're looking for selling points for doing comprehensive medical home care, and we've just been working with some health economists, and we're looking at numbers between four and five thousand uh, dollars, on average, per asthma patient saved to the system. Now the problem is, who actually saves it? The hospitals, the insurance companies. Uh, do you know who saves it, Jim? We, we don't. Who? Medicaid. Medicaid saves it. So there are. He says Medicaid. That's actually probably true, right? So um, what we're showing, and the point here is that we can save money by doing good quality care and keep kids uh, much more symptom free and out of hospitals. And that's, of course, good. I want to conclude with some uh, comments. Do I have a couple more minutes? Okay. About the barriers to uh, getting health care in the, in the way we're describing it, which is uh, comprehensive medical home type care. And it's a very, very complicated issue. And here's how we look at it. First of all, Clearly, the number one issue in terms of barriers has to do with this lack of health insurance. You know, still we have eight to nine million children who are without health insurance. Now, this is a, the math here is, is a little complex. So when we, when we had S-CHIP introduced in 1997, we had about 11 and a half million to 12 million uninsured children. We've, we've enrolled now about six and a half million. So, why, do we, why don't we have five million uninsured children? And the problem is that there's a certain attrition of the kids enrolled in private insurance as time has gone on, so we can't quite catch up. So we still have, as I say, eight to nine million kids uninsured, even though the ESCHA program has been pretty successful. We just need to complete that program and make sure there's no slippage. Two other points about this is that the lack of health insurance has a very important consequence in terms of the kind of health care children receive, and that is that uh, parents will report a three to four times less likely that their children uh, are in a, have a regular source of care. Now, we don't know exactly what regular source of care means. We have no quality measures, but I'm telling you that Many of the children who do have a source of care who are poor are not getting very good care and they're certainly not getting medical home care. So the, the number of children without health insurance who are, who are getting medical home type care is very, very low and that needs to be quantified, but, but uh, I really do believe it's, it's a, a dramatic problem. The second point is something circling back to what I was telling you about what politicians say about all this and uh, that is this point that poor access to medical care is not just about insurance and coverage. And I want to just uh, spend a minute going through what I'm talking about here, which is the concept of non-insurance barriers to health care, which are the real realities of uh, trying to exist and get services when you have uh, limited resources and limited access. First of all, a lot of people in America live in isolation, relatively speaking and, and actually speaking. Uh, this is a place in uh, West Virginia where we actually have a program, a uh, mobile program based in Huntington, West Virginia. This is 25 or 30 miles from there. This is actually used to be the uh, woodshed of uh, somebody's farm or house. And uh, the reason I'm showing it to you is that it's a place where rural homeless families would, would frequently squat. They would come in there with their kids and just take over, they'd stay there for a few weeks or a few months, and then they'd move on. And this is an extreme example of people who are transient and disconnected and homeless in, a, in this kind of uh, weird uh, rural way, and uh, they have obviously poor access to health care. Now, and they don't have doctors to begin with there. So uh, there is a problem in the United States which uh, is reflected in some of this data. And this one, there's different ways of looking at this. There's a federally uh, structured rating system or way of quantifying access to health care uh, in terms of the actual provider availability. So it's called HIPSAs or health professional shortage areas. And in 2008, 
folks, there were 5,800 federally designated HIPSAs in the United States, two-thirds of them rural, a third of them uh, urban, but 64 million Americans live in officially designated HIPSAs in the United States, and about 14 million children live there. And the point of that is, even if you have health insurance and you're living in a severe HIPSA, you, where are you going to take that insurance card if you don't have a, a provider uh, reasonably accessible for you to get to? So these shortage areas turn out to be a very important barrier in addition to the insurance issues. And there are other barriers. So this is, can you see this one? Right? Must be seen. Okay. This is George with a shovel. And I am taking the picture. And this is 1972, uh, approximately. And I was making a house call. George was driving me. It was the rainy season. And the roads got impassable. I lost at least two babies that I'm aware of. I'd come out of, uh, finished my residency with babies in uh, Denver, and I went to Arkansas pretty, pretty well trained up and ready for 1971 modern medicine. Uh, and here I am in the middle of nowhere, Brooklyn to Arkansas, and uh, finding myself with facing barriers that I had never dreamed, certainly no one had ever mentioned this in any of my training, which was that there was somebody that needed medical care at the end of this road over here someplace, and I actually physically couldn't get to the person. And uh, it was the demonstration of a barrier that's so profound and impactful on that uh, healthcare paradigm that I was mentioning in the beginning that it's really kind of stayed with me. And by the way, uh, I'm just going to say this so you understand this. This was a very, it was the sixth poorest county in the United States, Lee County, Arkansas then. And it was mostly African American, uh, but the uh, very small white minority owned all the power and the money. So judge, whatever his name was, controlled where, where dollars were spent. So there were paved roads and graveled roads in Lee County, Arkansas, except they weren't on roads that led to clusters of African American housing. So this was, you can imagine, at, at uh, 26, 27 years old, I'm of the uh, Kennedy Johnson era. I am really, really unhappy uh, about this grotesque, racially driven injustice that, we were, that was actually interfering with medical care. So I had no choice but to get involved very, very politically during those years. I'm just telling you this because sometimes the underlying issues that have to be dealt with uh, so far transcend uh, shots and prescriptions that you just find yourself in an orbit that you may not be used to and certainly we're not trained for. Uh, if you want to discuss that later, I will, but I should probably not dwell on that at the moment. It's riling me up already, but. <laughs> much, much later, this is Tunica County, Mississippi, where we have uh, one of our, uh, our uh, CHF, Children's Health Fund, uh, projects. This is a car that actually works sometimes. It's in the driveway of a house uh, where a very poor family lives. And uh, so the question is, can uh, little Johnny, the three-year-old, go to the clinic to get the next well-child visit, to get screened for something, to get a follow-up, to have his wheezing check? Uh, well, it, it depends. It depends if Johnny's father is using that car if it's working to go to work. But if he's going to work, that's the first priority. Whether Johnny gets anything resembling routine care uh, is absolutely secondary or tertiary to that primary use of the car. So even though there was a spectacularly good uh, community health center, federally funded community health center, only a few miles away, the family couldn't get there. The subway seems to be out of order in Tunica County. And so the absence of transportation is one of those other non-insurance barriers that I was mentioning. And we're going to come to the conclusion in a minute. Uh, suffice it to say, we've looked at this twice. We think there's between three and four million uh, low-income children around the United States that are affected by a lack of affordable transportation, uh, which represents a barrier to medical care. So I'll conclude by saying that currently in the United States, there's 75 million children, more or less, under the age of 19, uh, 8 to 9 million without insurance. Uh, about 5 million, we think, are underinsured, which means they may have insurance for catastrophic illness, not for ambulatory uh, or other reasons, or they're insured for part of the year and not all the year, uh, and so forth. Uh, the non-insurance barriers, so living in HIPSAs, the transportation issues, cultural and language barriers represent some other number of millions. 
So we think of the 75 million American children, probably in the range of 20 million have some kind of barriers, uh, barrier or barriers which affect their ability to access health care. And they're very complex barriers that are not solved by simply the insurance card, as you, as you heard me repeat uh, an annoyingly large number of times already. Okay. So the things that I, I think need to be done right now, I'm going to tell you the five strategies, as I promised the last slide, is that first of all, we, we have to get universal health coverage. We have to take that first big beast and conquer it. We got to, we got to make sure the insurance issue is off the table. Uh, Barack Obama, as you know, is proposing mandated uh, coverage of children in a very expanded SCHIP program through uh, young people age 25, and that uh, hopefully would be something, no matter what the economy is, uh, would be uh, proposed. Secondly, we have to be very explicit about this new paradigm of care, about the medical home, and even better, the enhanced medical home, medical home for at-risk populations. We have to get our voice down there where the policymakers are so they understand what we're trying to do. Thirdly, in the meantime, there's a lot of work on the safety net programs. SCHIP, the Community Health Centers, the National Health Service Corps, and so forth, which all need to be uh, bolstered. Uh, fourth, uh, we need to work on the understanding of and elimination of those barriers that I've been uh, referring to. And finally, um, and I know uh, Dr. Perrin is, and others are very, very involved in this, we really have to get to the notions of quality and accountability throughout the system. Um, so uh, this is where I'd like to kind of leave it with, with somewhat of an action uh, concept here. And I think um, uh, how we get through this and, and deal with all of this uh, depends a lot on politics and economics, as it always does. And it actually, it actually is driven a little bit by, by ideology, which is really quite unfortunate. So uh, do we have any time for questions? So uh, why don't any comments or questions would be uh, welcome. Criticisms even, right? I mean, why not? Evidence-based med medicine, yeah, sorry. And, and by the way, this is, I want to say a thing about this evidence-based medicine, which, you know, many of us are proponents of, myself included, but there are issues with it and, you know, do we have enough evidence to, to drive all our decision-making and we don't, uh, but we're trying to get it. Um, and there, without belaboring the point, I think there's a, there, is, there is something complex about it completely adopting an evidence-based uh, medical practice system, but we have to drive towards that. But I wanted to point out that I'm very involved in uh, disaster planning, um, and hardly anything that would be used as a medical countermeasure for children affected by, let's say, weapons of mass destruction or uh, biological problems, hardly anything has been tested in children. So we're completely guessing at what we need to put in the stockpiles to take care of kids. We have no evidence, period, uh, about whether we should use Cipro or not in young children if they're exposed, uh, you know, uh, Mark I kits for kids exposed to, uh, to chemical agents. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no consensus and there's no evidence. So what happens is they don't do anything. So children are just left, you know, God forbid one of these things happen, uh, that we're gonna be very, very unprepared to deal with children. Just a, just a little note about that, but yes. There seems to be two uh, issues going on, one to expand coverage and one to contain costs. And uh, certainly expanding coverage is going to potentially result in increasing costs. Do you think we could squeeze enough savings out of our current medical system to do both, uh, to expand coverage and, and improve quality of care? And I guess you've been talking about that. I, yes, you know, uh, right. That's a very good question. And, you know, um, uh, Democrats running for high office like to say that we, in fact, can squeeze a lot of savings if we, if we modernize health care with uh, chronic disease management protocols, with electronic health records, uh, and so forth. We can actually save a lot of money. I think that's true. Sometimes I think we're maybe a little enthusiastic about how rapidly that will happen, but the fact is that it is possible that we can get a lot of savings out of the system. You know, we're spending $2.1 trillion a year 
on medical care in the United States. At least a third of that is waste and bureaucratic stuff with insurance companies, with, with uh, you know, repeating tests that don't need to be done. I'll just tell you a very quick uh, story. My, my daughter-in-law, who's a physician uh, and internist at uh, Mount Sinai, did a residency at Montefiore. She said, uh, you know, they get patients who had been totally worked up for something at a hospital five miles away. They could not get the medical records. So they just repeat everything, the MRIs, the CAT scans, all the blood work. You know, it just is happening thousands of times a day all over the country because we don't have a way of, of moving information around safely and securely and appropriately for uh, providing what, what's needed. So there's a lot that could be uh, dragged out of the system, but even if it requires an investment, which of course it will, in the first few years, I think it's essential that we do that. Yes. I have a question. Um, how is the Children's Health Fund funded? Sounds like a song of some sort. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the Children's Health Fund uh, was initially funded by uh, Paul Simon. And uh, it really, all it was at that point was we were trying to get a, buy a mobile unit. I, I had thought about this idea, and uh, Paul and I had been to the uh, welfare hotels and shelters, and I said, I, I think we should do this kind of, uh, you know, modern house call and bring, the, bring a mobile medical unit. And at that point, the cost of a mobile medical unit was $87,000. Um, my wife, Karen, who's the executive director of the fund uh, now, uh, designed it. And uh, Paul called a number of his friends in the business. This is, he was just coming back from his Graceland tour. He called, I don't know, people that you would have heard of. And I was sitting there in his office. He was on the phone trying to explain to them a, what we had seen in the, uh, in the shelters, and B, what was needed. And I kept hearing him say, well, I'm just, what do you mean you don't understand? Over and over again. And finally hung up, he said, uh, you know, I'm just gonna, I'll just buy it. And he wrote the first check. That was then. And then we were all sort of volunteers at that point. Now we don't have any volunteers. We have 22 programs. We have a very aggressive advocacy agenda. And our budget's around $20 million a year. And a mobile unit, a new one, costs $300,000 now uh, fully equipped. And the money comes from uh, corporations, foundations, individuals, events, and so forth. And that 20 million leverages about 70 million because we also bring in a lot of federal money in Medicaid, SCHIP uh, reimbursements, uh, and other, other uh, federal type grants. So it's a pretty elaborate system right now. And all those uh, projects around the country are partnered with a local institution. So the Children's Health Fund the, the doctors in Phoenix are not, don't get their check from the fund, they get it because of the fund, but they get it from their, you know, in that case, Phoenix Children's Hospital. Mike Segarra. Um, the concept of universal health care is being uh, much more accepted in the medical community, especially by medical organizations, but there are still significant pockets of resistance to universal insurance. Yes. So the question is, how are, you going to, how are you going to convince the uh, rest of the medical community? Is that a statement or a question? Uh, no, a question. A statement. How, yeah. how do you propose, I mean, yeah. there are going well, to be pockets look, of resistance. How yeah. do you propose to I, I think, it was very, you know, I was involved, as Dan mentioned, in the, in the health reform efforts in 93 and 94 with the Clintons. And at that point, there was massive, not just passiveness, but resistance by medical organizations uh, lack of cooperation and coordination among those who were interested in the, in the concept, and massive resistance among business communities. The, the problems have so exacerbated over the last 15, 16 years that we've seen a, a turning of the tide within medicine with many, many more people and organizations now understanding that it's mandatory, and a compelling message from the business community says, we cannot afford this anymore. Of course, you buy a Toyota, $300 of the window sticker price goes to provide health insurance for Toyota workers in Japan. You buy a, a General Motors car, and it's $1,600 in the price of the car in there for health insurance. We can't compete internationally, so the, the pressures are much greater, and the quality of practice for a lot of doctors has gone down the tubes. We have, for the Obama, Doctors for Obama website now, uh, about 10,000 doctors formally signed up and some multiple that actually working out uh, in this various states. I'm just 
using as an example, I'm, I think we're seeing a very big change and people will come along or, or they won't, but I think uh, some sort of health reform is inevitable. We'll be at, we'll be at $4 trillion by 2015, which will be almost 20% of the GDP. And at that point, we'll have something that will cause fiscal repercussions that, that will make uh, what we're dealing with now seem like, you know, old school. First of all, it should be clear that the medical home applies to everyone, not just indigent, indigent patients. So, so you want, the medical home, the concept yeah. of the medical yeah. home should apply to everyone. That's good medical care. But aside yes. from that, have you seen any, any evidence that programs like, like CHOPS, for instance, where they want to expand into a, an extended medical home, which looks like sort of a megalopolis of satellites and things, that that's working, that that's having an effect in terms of delivering comprehensive care. In other words, is there data to, to say that it's better if you actually? Yeah, we've got a that you're delivering care, we've got we get a better outreach. outcome. You're, are you asking about better that you're delivering more care? That, we, that the kids are getting better, more comprehensive care because things are centered within yeah. multidisciplinary groups and stuff. Yeah, I think we're just now beginning to see some data around that, but we there is not a lot of literature yet to support what we believe uh, intuitively is the right thing to do. And I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know, I don't have that information myself. Are you, are you, oh, I think CHOP, you're talking about CHOP's program? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you, in, are you involved in it? I'm, yeah, I, I, I've done a step at CHOP since the 70s. So how, how's it doing? Well, it seems to be good, but I'm not privy to all the... All yeah, the yeah. I don't think well. I don't think we have all the data, and yet I think, as far as I know from Chop, though, uh, people are just beginning to look at and, and analyze that in pretty sophisticated ways. But I don't think there's been any data out there out of there yet. I could be I could be wrong, but I don't I don't think so. Okay, I think we have to move on.